But you're over here not as director of cricket or captain, you're over here as the commissioner. Tell us about this new T20 league that you've set up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that's been in the making in South African cricket for a long time. I think it's been trialled once or twice and SA cricket never quite got it right. Um, and I just think it was important. South African cricket needed to, to get something, needed to get its own commercial uh, league going, you know, like the rest of the world has, get a seat at the table. Um, and it's something we're very excited about. It's taken a year of hard work to get to where we are now. Um, and, yeah, we're excited with the partners that we got and, and we're looking forward to it. You, South Africa pulled out of three ODIs in Australia uh, in order to make sure your best players are available for the, for the new league. Just talk about... Um, that decision, the possible ramifications. I mean, you may have to, it may cost you World Cup qualification points. And is that decision a kind of pointer to where the priorities are going to be in the future? I don't think so. I think, look, for four weeks of, the, of, of an entire year, the priority will be, you know, the, the league. I, you know, I, 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 I fear that if we hadn't done this, just looking at it, South African cricket could have probably lost eight to ten players to this this UAE league, you know, with, with, with that going on. So there has to be an, an element of investment into our game to keep our players. The free agencies are a big issue. But I, I think that people also look at those three ODIs wrong. I mean, yes, South Africa hasn't handled their, their ODI cricket as well. It should, should never be in this position. But for South Africa to be in Australia out of their, their key part of the summer, financially is a huge stress for them. It's like asking England not to play uh, during your summer. So I think the commitment that South African cricket has made to go for those three test matches, one, I think is, is good for the game. Uh, it's something that won't happen often. Um, and two, I know that Cricket South Africa bent over backwards with Cricket Australia to try and find a solution. Um, but, you know, either you move this way, then they, then they take priority in their big bash. And, you know, I, I really know that Cricket South Africa really tried hard to solve that problem with them. So there are six new franchise teams that are all privately owned. So private equity is coming into South African cricket. All the owners are IPL owners. Just talk to us because we're probably going to face that here with the 100 in a few years' time. It's fairly certain to me that ECB will look to sell those teams. Talk to me about both the opportunity and the inherent dangers in private equity coming in into a, into a game. I think for me... I'd so, Cricket South Africa is still the major shareholder in this. You know, the, the, the investment into the South African game is still going to happen. It's, it's not people coming in and taking cricket away from, from the federation as maybe what's happening in the UAE. You know, a, a majority South African-based uh, player group, investment into the game, investment into grassroots as well, taking pressure off Cricket South Africa. I mean, big part of this private ownership, you know, these, uh, these owners had to look at the grassroots programs, the development programs and how they would impact that and the investment into that, so that's huge. I think uh, our player opportunity now, um, the professionalism into the game, the opportunity for our players to interact with some of the top players in the world, top coaches, you know, a really professional cricket environment, I think is, is, is important for us. Um, and hopefully that will see a talent pool that really gets stronger and stronger and benefit cricket across the board. But we needed partners that were sustainable, um, efforts that could help us carry this league into the future, build with us, you know, not looking to make uh, a, you know, a, a dollar early on that they were prepared to invest in South Africa cricket and grow this opportunity with us. And I think the key difference for us is that the money will flow still in back into the game. You, you've talked about all the opportunities there. I mean, are there any dangers? Obviously, private equity is looking for a profit at the end of the day. You may say that it's not going to be an immediate profit. Um, Cricket South Africa will be the regulator of the competition, so you're keeping some kind of ownership and control there. But do you see any potential uh, drawbacks and dangers to private equity? Uh, we don't. I mean, we went through a really independent process. Yeah, um, you know, we hired an audit firm to assess to find the most sustainable partners that we could. So, I think it's fantastic for our game. I mean, it's uh, it's certainly going to be an investment into our game that South African cricket desperately needed. You know, I think the pressures on nations like, I guess, New Zealand, West Indies, South Africa, you know, to stay financially sustainable, to, to, to keep up with the Englands, the Indias and the world game, to stay competitive is, is hugely important. You know, we don't, I don't think world cricket can afford South Africa or any one of the top nations to start fading away. The standard of the game, the investment into the game. So this helps us. I think this, this benefits that. Uh, and, and hopefully you know, that'll flow into the test cricket standards, the one-day one cricket, the international T20s. The challenge, I guess, is the world game and how it balances itself. And that, I think that's what everyone's trying to figure out right now.
And that is the key issue, isn't it? Because I understand your decision and your desire to have a seat at the table, as you put it. ECB have done exactly that with 100. But every nation has one. The calendar for international cricket just get squeezed. Can you also see a, a scenario whereby one of the big franchises might, let's say, take a Joss Butler or Joffre Archer or Kahisa Rabada and say, well, we'll contract you for 12 months and use you at our various leagues and then, all right, you can go and play for South Africa now. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that's something that needs to be discussed, you know, because that's, you can't say that's not going to be an option um, the way the world game is moving. But even the ICC, I mean, their focus has moved into events-based mm. tournaments, you know, with, with a tournament now happening every year. You can see that their focus is moving into that space as well. Bilaterals, I guess the context of the bilaterals, I mean, these type of test series are fantastic to watch, but when you're throwing in two ODIs here and a T20 over there and, you know, you're making up all the stuff to try and make sure you, you get your broad, it just people get confused and it's, and, and it's hard for the players as well. So I think there does need to be a you know, pretty decent conversation in terms of how that's going to be structured going forward and, and how to make the most of the world game. And I mentioned all the franchises are IPL-owned franchises now in, in South Africa. Uh, why, why no South African companies get the bid? I know you're at arm's length slightly and you ran it through Deloitte's, but is there a frustration in South Africa that there are no kind of big-name South African companies involved? Well, I think when we started this project, we would have loved that. But, you know, you've got to, you've got to attract them. You know, people will have to have the appetite for that as well. That, you know, and uh, we had one or two that, that tried. And just, you know, the, for a league... We couldn't afford to carry people in the league. You know, we, we wanted this thing to be sustainable from the start. And I think most people in South Africa have been really impressed with the, the way South African cricket has been over the last few years, that, that people wanted to invest in our game, that they wanted to come and bring their, 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 their financial side, their, their experience at running these type of things. You know, they're some of the most iconic cricket franchises in the world now that you are know, investing in South African cricket. So I think that was a big surprise for most people that that, that is happening. I think there's still opportunities down the line. I think the, the, the economic impact on South Africa is going to be massive. You know, the investment into the workforces, the agencies, the people on the ground. Uh, the, you know, our president has been desperately asking for investment into the country. And cricket is now at the forefront of that as well. So I think there will be a lot that will come. Well, he talked about the squeeze on the international calendar because every country will have its kind of window for its own franchise tournament. You mentioned that the ICC are essentially moving to an event every year. Do you worry about South Africa and Test cricket, that relationship in the future? If you look at the Future Tours programme, I think South Africa is scheduled to play 28 Test matches over that five-year period of the next Future Tours programme, which is way down from the number of Tests that England, India and Australia will play. Is that a concern? I actually don't know why that is the case. I'd be, I'd be interested to ask with the, you know, uh, Paletzi, the CEO, and see why that was the case. But I don't think there's any, any intent to, to, to not play Test cricket. But I think, in general, even in even in the time I played, England always were playing more Tests than, than most people. It was just, I think, with a lot of five-match Test series. And but uh, you know, I, I, there's no reason there. I, I think you know, you look at this team now. Uh, they fought really hard around the world to develop this test side. They take pride in it. They've, they've, their performances have been excellent. I know there are a lot of people back home watching this with pride. You know, so I, I guess for me, you see a lot around one-day cricket at the moment, and you know, international T20s should it be a domestic-based tournament? So all that stuff needs to be debated. Um, but I still see that there will be a in South African cricket. And I'm hoping that what what we, what we do at the league, the investment into the players, the grassroots, you know, that that talent will flow across the board and do you still sense with the young players coming through obviously it's a very different landscape to when you were a 21 year old and, and you know brought in to play and captain South Africa at an unbelievably tender age it's a very different landscape now do you still see with the young South African players coming through a desire and an appetite to play first class cricket and test cricket yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see there's someone like a Diervold Brevis now, yeah. you know. He's really talented. He's contracted by MI9. In, in and he's two, been here for the, the Reliance fans. team in England yeah, this summer. Been, yeah, I mean, they've, they, it also helps us. They're investing in him, growing him. He's touring here. He's being looked after. I know he travelled with the national team now, but if, I think if you had to ask him, he had a real appetite to play for South Africa. He still has that pride of wanting to be there. You know, and I think what we're hoping now, this four-week tournament can really keep those players in our game. You know, we won't lose them to other leagues and they'll choose to still sign their local contract, be invested in South African cricket because, you know, we're now topping them up financially. There's that big opportunity to interact with the IPL franchises, maybe go through to IPL. More of our players go through into the IPL. So we're hoping that that investment into the player group now will keep them in our game longer. 
So a question to you both, actually, really. Where, in your opinion, will Test Match Cricket be the World Test Match game in a decade? Uh, Wardy, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Things... Give it your best shot, yeah. Smithy. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I would love to still say that these... I mean, but test cricket in itself, it's just the iconic nations or the big cricketing nations that are, that are contributing to test cricket at the moment. Um, I think it's fantastic, especially under Virat Kohli, that India really took test cricket seriously. They, they led the way with that. Um, but as long as we've got competitive teams, you're not going to have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 competitive teams. You might only be down to five or six nations that play test cricket you know, at this level. Well, I, I, as you know, I've been pretty downbeat about the prospects for test cricket really ever since the IPL came along because I thought that would the two clear trends that would happen one that T20 cricket would challenge test cricket and secondly that domestic cricket franchise cricket would grow in importance and stature compared to international cricket so I I hope that there's a a place and a room for test cricket because I do think that it's a a precious form of the game I know the game changes everything changes but I think if it if the game lost uh, cricket played over the multi-day of a format, it would lose something precious. So a bit of leadership at, at the top table to try and carve out space and room uh, for the five-day game. And also you do need space and room then for first-class cricket in your domestic competitions. England do need to play a certain amount of championship cricket. Um, so I hope there's space for it, uh, even though obviously there are challenges. So back to Test Match Cricket and specifically at this ground, you've got happy memories here, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're look- not going to get him talking about this again. We'll be here for days. <laughs> well, let's talk about the drop catch, Where's though. Ness? Where's Nat? Where <laughs> memories of that day? Oh, I mean, I, you just couldn't, couldn't have asked for more, really. I mean, won the toss and bowling the night cheaply. It probably should have batted. Bad decision. Um, <laughs> And then Nass dropped me on nine and <laughs> everything flowed from there, you know. Uh, just, just one of those memories. And I, I think I remember, you might have interviewed me after uh, that, those two double hundreds. You said, is this going to be a defining moment in your career? And I was 22. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, come on. Man, you know. But, you know, you come back here today, you still hold the record, you see your band out there, the name on the dressing room. It's just, it's just one of those places that just fills you with really great emotions and memories. This guy was a fantastic cricketer, uh, you know, and a lot of admiration for people at the top of the order, obviously do it for a long period of time, but not just that, doing it as captain. How long were you captain for? Ten years? Yeah, about the 11. I mean, that is a, an incredible, I say burden, I mean, you know, it's still a wonderful thing to do, but there are pressures and particular pressures when you're captain in South Africa as well, of the kind that, you know, captains of other countries don't necessarily appreciate. So a tremendous amount of admiration for the length of time that he did it. What was that journey like, though, for you as captain in the team to number one in the world in the Test Match rankings? You know, those first few years, I think a lot of people thought I was arrogant, but actually it was just a really self-protective mode. You know, everywhere I went as a young captain, you're being challenged in the media, crowds, opposition, you know, trying to take you on. So you form this defensive thing. And I think what kept me in the job in those early years was I had some people skills. I had really good support from the senior players, but also I scored runs. But, you know, that was what probably kept me in the job for the first couple of years. It was around that 2007 period that I sat down and got to grips with the leadership. You know, I really started thinking about, you know, how I want the team to play, the type of personnel we wanted, how we would operate. And that period from then on in was where I really felt settled as a captain. I was more relaxed in control of what I was doing. Uh, built a, we built an amazing team, you know, likes of Umlers and Staines and De Villiers and the like, you know. Uh, and, yeah, coming here and uh, having the success we had, yeah, winning here twice. I mean, Matthew, you talk about moments. I mean, beating England here twice, beating Australia at home twice was something that South African cricket couldn't have well, dreamt that, of. That at was the, the time, measure yeah. of that side, really. Yeah. It was a top class side that yeah. went to number one in the world. But their record away from home in particular was fantastic. And, you know, lots of teams are very strong in their home conditions. If you can put that together with a strong away record and become a rounded team in all conditions, that's the measure of a great team, really. Good afternoon session here, and your boys could be close well, to wrapping I mean, it I'm up. I've keeping myself steady, but now that I've finished with the two of you, I'm going to go and uh, pour something nice and hopefully see a lot of wickets fall after lunch. Uh, England have got to go some here. England's middle order, the key here. Root, top class. Besto, top class. Stokes, top class player. They still get themselves out of a hole, but they've got a long way to go. Yeah, actually, I, I always like to target people like Roots. I always think they're key because, you know, he holds it together for everybody else to play the way they play. You know, we used to think about Trot uh, and, you know, KP after him. But if you knock over Trot, then suddenly the, the expressive player's got to think a bit more. So I, I see Roots as the key wicket. 
been great to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts and good luck with your new T20 tournament, Mr Commissioner. <laughs> Doesn't Thank sit right, really. that, does it? <laughs>